Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, The Benefits of Working with a Freight Forwarder. My name is Kenneth Click, and I'm a Business Development Specialist for XM. I'll be your moderator today. Discussing today's topic are Richard Foy, Regional Director for XM, and Paul Derzombek, Chief Operating Officer of LR International. Before we begin the presentation, just a reminder to please stay tuned for the Q&A session that takes place at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to turn it over to Paul Jarzombek, Chief Operating Officer of LR International. Welcome, Paul. Well, thanks very much, Ken, and welcome to everyone. Glad you could be here for this important session. Today, we're talking about logistics support related to exporting. Uh, my name is Paul Jarzombek. My company is LR International. We're freight forwarders and customs brokers. Uh, we're headquartered in Chicago, just two miles east of O'Hare International Airport. We help companies move their cargo around the world. Uh, we also do a lot of other support services. And one of the things we do is work closely with organizations like the Export Import Bank of the United States, uh, helping export clients make sure that when they do the hard work of selling goods overseas and finding customers and, and building high quality products, they can get paid on their international orders. And um, that's certainly um, uh, for, in the forefront of everyone's mind. So my goal today is to, uh, with uh, Rich, to help you uh, understand the um, different aspects of working with a freight forwarder, why a freight forwarder is an important piece in the overall uh, process. We're also gonna touch on uh, INCO terms and some risk management, risk mitigation uh, issues as well. So uh, the first topic is really just the role of a freight forwarder, um, understanding um, why you need a freight forwarder when you're exporting, and what, what does a freight forwarder do uh, in the process. A freight forwarder is really a flexible extension of your uh, international uh, functions, of your team. Um, the freight forwarder stands between you, the exporter, and carriers around the world that move cargo. Um, freight forwarders uh, at their core are shipping companies. They, they book cargo with carriers uh, and then they work on things like documentation and customs requirements around the world to make sure that your shipments ultimately get to your customer and that you have a, a successful uh, export process. So freight forwarders are an agent for international carriers. They're also an agent for the exporter. So we say in the freight forwarding business, uh, that we serve two masters, really, uh, one of which being the exporter and another being those carriers that we have to have good relationships with uh, in order to get your cargo uh, exported uh, successfully. We want to be a logistics planning partner with exporters. Um, we prefer to be involved early in the process so that we um, can provide options. There are usually several ways to do every type of, um, of export shipment. And we want to give our clients those options and, and help them make uh, good decisions. We want to be a planning partner. Uh, we're certainly a liaison between the exporter and other service providers, including XM Bank. Uh, we interact often with either XM Bank or potentially our exporter's commercial banking partner. Um, we interface with insurance companies, packing and crating companies, certainly custom services around the world and the federal government in the United States in terms of export compliance. So we like to say that the freight forwarder is kind of the conduit or the glue that pulls together all of the different parties that an exporter may work with to facilitate uh, and complete their export shipments. Uh, and lastly, the documentation. Um, you know, the documentation is really a key piece to any export transaction. We can do everything right, but if something's wrong with the documents, usually uh, the shipment may experience some kind of delay or hold up overseas. And as a freight forwarder, we work with exporters to sort of scrub their documentation and make sure that all of the component parts of it are correct and are going to be compliant in the country that they're exporting to. And that, that can involve um, uh, the documentation associated with making sure that you get paid for your export orders. So that could be a commercial banking instrument like a letter of credit or, or some instrument like that, or it could be in conjunction with offering your, your customer overseas terms and uh, some 
credit insurance that's built in uh, to that process to protect you, the exporter. And that's certainly where we interact with uh, XM Bank on a regular basis. There are documentation requirements that XM Bank has um, that we're going to talk about a little bit later that every exporter who works with XM does have to comply with to make sure uh, that their exports um, are protected uh, correctly with that insurance coverage. So that's sort of, uh, I guess, the basics of the role of the freight forwarder. I, I think uh, uh, Richard's going to now talk a little bit about INCO terms, uh, terms of sale uh, in the export process. So take it away, Rich. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, I always think it's important when discussing uh, freight forwarders and the relationship to kind of dive into INCO terms. INCO terms used often determine your relationship uh, with your freight forwarder. Uh, when you defer the transportation decisions to your buyer, you, you will re reduce the work and decision making needed to affect the shipment. But what else are you giving up? So I, I want to take a quick look into the key INCO term buckets so you understand a little bit better. X-Works terms, for example, exporter deals with a routed forwarder. It's somebody else's uh, forwarder. And, and as the exporter, you have no control over compliance. You have no control over the shipment and really no control over payment either. On F terms, you have um, the exporter has to deliver the cargo to the U.S. border. So you gain some uh, control of the compliance, you have limited shipment control, and you have some payment control, control and that uh, allows you to comply with, with an XM or other um, insurance policy. On a C term, uh, the exporter nominates the forwarder to deliver the goods to the foreign port. So the exporter has control over compliance, control over the shipment, and control over the payment. On D terms, then we move a little bit uh, further, the exporter delivers to the buyer's doorstep and the exporter has control over the compliance, control over the shipment, and now you, you move and you have some exposure to overseas risk. So the bottom line is when you, when, this is not a full presentation of ANCO terms, I wanna be clear, uh, but I hope you see from the previous slides that when choosing an ANCO term for your sale, the potential impact and important considerations. And the bottom line is when you bear the cost, you gain control. And control and exporting is very important and a very valuable uh, thing. We, um, we look here, some of the consequences, risk mitigation, what, what additional costs um, are, are resulting from the INCO term selection, payment risk uh, associated with a, an INCO term, and cargo insurance uh, for sure is a major consideration as you have a variety of different types of coverage when you're talking about cargo insurance. Um, with the sophistication of shipping today, things go right far more than they go wrong. So that's a good thing. But it's important to keep in mind what can go wrong and that your shipments can be involved. So I want Paul to kind of go over, since he's really on the front lines, I want him to go over some uh, things that can go wrong. And we have some, uh, some slides to that effect. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Appreciate that. So, um, you know, what could possibly go wrong with a question mark? Well, I've been doing this for 31 years, and um, I've seen all sorts of uh, unique situations uh, that crop up. Um, again, this is an important reason to have the right kind of partners uh, supporting you, whether it's uh, an, an entity like the Export-Import Bank in the United States and the coverage and protection that they provide, certainly having a good freight forwarder uh, that you have an ongoing regular relationship with. And, and you may have several freight forwarders. It's, it's rare that any one freight forwarder can be all things to all people. So it's not a bad idea to have maybe uh, more than one, maybe uh, a, a, a select few that you've um, uh, done your uh, due diligence with and have uh, have regular meetings with regarding your international transactions. Now you can see in the picture here, you know this is a this is a, a uh, cargo insurance claim, really a, an emergency situation. And and cargo insurance and claims related to that um, are an important piece to the export process because unfortunately cargo handlers around the world are not careful. Uh, their goal is really to maximize 
the space and consolidation aspects of moving cargo around the world, really to maximize profits for whoever they happen to be working for, whether it's the carrier or the port or the airport or, or what have you. Um, and so their first concern is not the careful handling of your cargo, unfortunately. Um, and so accidents and, and claims uh, can occur. I think we have a couple of additional pictures of um, you know, things that have gone wrong from a claim standpoint. I get this question a lot from people, you know, how often are there really, you know, really uh, bad storms at sea or, or other situations where, where cargo claims occur? And unfortunately, my answer is, you know, somewhat often. So proper cargo insurance coverage, which is separate from your, uh, from your accounts receivable uh, insurance and protection, you know, cargo insurance coverage will, will protect against damage, loss, theft, uh, um, things of that nature. And those things certainly happen. But even aside from those things, some of the perils around the world when you're exporting uh, come up and they're unexpected. You, you may have a situation where uh, a government changes hands you know, unexpectedly, um, where there's maybe a change in regimes, or uh, there could be a significant weather-related event that shuts a uh, a country and its financial institutions uh, down. And so there are a lot of risks out there that you have to uh, mitigate against. Your freight forwarder is going to help connect you to the right organization or agency that provides that kind of risk mitigation coverage or service. And so again, I said before, freight forwarder is kind of the glue that really pulls the entire export uh, transaction together. And uh, I'd stand behind that. And, and I think when in doubt, just ask your freight forwarder, say, okay, I'm concerned about this risk. Um, what's your suggestion for mitigating that risk? And I would say very often your freight forwarder will have a strategy if you don't already have one, you know, in place uh, at your company. So um, just be aware of those risks. Um, we talked a little bit previously about documentation requirements. Uh, there's some risk inherent in getting the documents right as well. And your freight forwarder uh, tends to help you, the exporter, pull that together. Now, this graphic kind of shows you the typical responsibilities from a documentation standpoint uh, on a traditional export. As you can see in the center, the exporter bears uh, quite a bit of responsibility. Some of it's shared, most of it is directly the exporter's responsibility. Things like uh, invoices in the transaction and um, properly documenting how the shipment is packed. There's an export declaration process that the US government requires of all exporters, um, pushing those data elements from the export, the, the important details related to the export uh, into the system that the federal government kind of monitors and maintains. In some cases, you may have exports that require permission from the US government, and that's where an export license comes into play. Certain certificates of origin for, for shipping around the world, very common today because of the many free trade agreements that are out there, not just the US having roughly 22 free trade agreements, but the rest of the world has free trade agreements of their own. And so certificates of origin, um, you know, very common uh, documentation requirement. Uh, as, as I said before, we as a freight forwarder uh, collaborate pretty often with uh, Exim. And um, there are documentation requirements that Exim has when you have a policy with them in order to make sure that um, you can prove that your goods were exported. Um, they have to actually be exported in order for that coverage uh, to be in place. And, uh, and so there are some requirements there. Your buyer overseas has some requirements from a documentation standpoint. Most of those have to do with the importation of the cargo into their country and um, not a whole lot of overlap uh, with you, the exporter, unless there's a, a banking instrument involved. Uh, freight forwarders issue transport documents and then they assist with that group of documents that's in the overlap with the export. If documents have to be legalized or chamberized by a foreign um, embassy here in the United States, or again, cargo insurance, when that's um, something that the freight forwarder may be um, providing on behalf of the exporter, which is uh, pretty common. Um, 
other specialized documents like carnets for trade shows, which is a sort of a temporary passport for cargo that's that's moving around the world um, in conjunction with trade shows or demonstrations. Freight forwarders get involved in those. Certainly freight forwarders help exporters file the necessary e uh, EEI or, or electronic export information data elements through the AES filing or, or shipper's export declaration. Uh, freight forwarders are 95% of the time doing that in conjunction with the exporter. So it's a, uh, a process they do on behalf of the export. So the documentation requirements can be a little bit, um, they can appear a little bit complicated. Uh, actually, if you're working closely with your freight forwarder, most of these can be put together um, pretty easily. And I would just encourage you to collaborate with your freight forwarder um, you know, on those documentation requirements. As I said before, you can do everything right, but if there's something wrong with the documents, it can be rather frustrating and shipments can be uh, delayed a little bit as a result of that. So you wanna be talking about this early and often uh, with your freight forwarder. Uh, Rich, I think you have the next section. Yeah, and I, you know, I just wanna to add to this. This is very elaborate uh, slide indicating the, the extensive documentation that goes into an export. And new exporters in particular um, love the fact that freight forwarders have the ability to take on a lot of this uh, this work for them. And I caution everybody not to become too dependent on their forwarder, particularly for their interpretation of what it is that you're exporting. We've seen this time and time again. You know, they defer to a freight forwarder for the um, you know, various classification of their product, and it ends up uh, perhaps being wrong because your forwarder doesn't know your product the way you do. And this can result in, you know, fines, penalties, and, and so on. So where a freight forwarder is an excellent partner, um, definitely from a strategy standpoint and from a compliance, um, you ultimately own the, the any transmission of information. So uh, you know, definitely want to be an equal or a leading um, part of, of that. Um, so let's see what I have. So Ford's relationship, I mean, this goes to what I was just talking about, uh, trust and control. And, you know, I like that, that Paul didn't present, uh, you know, Ford as, as you should have one. I think it's also important to have relationships uh, with several. And you're going to have varying relationships. Uh, maybe you'll have a good relationship with one of your key customers, forwarders. You don't actually feed them any business uh, yourself, but they know you as a customer. They know what your requirements are as, uh, as, as an exporter, and you do build that relationship. Um, so trust and, and control is, is very important. And I'm going to dive into control because I think it's really uh, very, very important. Um, when you're arranging for the shipment, obviously you have control. These elements, um, you want to choose a reliable carrier. You want to ensure your cargo moves as scheduled. You want to maintain control over the cost uh, so that you can maximize your, your margin, of course. When you, when you have a relationship uh, with a forwarder or ideally a few forwarders, you'll be able to leverage that relationship and get preferred rates and perhaps shipping priority in, in, uh, in key times. And even uh, if you're shipping under an INCO term that does not require your coordinating the shipping, it's important that you exercise control over the transaction. So this includes contacting the routed freight forwarder ahead of the transaction to explain what you will require to have complete documentation provided to you. If they are to file any documents to government agencies on your behalf, that you are provided, you provide them with accurate information ahead of the shipment, and you obtain copies of the final documents and ensure their accuracy. So, like I was uh, saying before, incorrect or incomplete documentation can result in fines and penalties. And I'm not here to scare anyone; just you know, be truthful. Um, and, and they can threaten your export privileges. Now, because we're, uh, we're XM Bank, we're interested in you getting paid. Letters of credit, of course, have very specific requirements that must be adhered to. Often cases, your forwarder is a key partner in there because they're preparing the export documents that ultimately you're presenting to the bank. Export credit insurance is a, a little bit more lenient. We don't have stringent uh, requirements in, in terms of 
clauses that have to be on documents and so on. But we do require in the case of a claim, you present a complete export file. And that would be proof of export, proof, proof of the transaction from, from cradle to grave, I'll say. Um, so this is where a freight forwarder relationship is very important. And that even when you're not driving the shipment to the forwarder, that they understand what your requirements are. And again, not just because you're not paying for the cargo does not mean that you don't have a right to ask for and receive all the documents prepared. Um, cargo insurance, uh, like I was saying earlier, and Paul also uh, stated, there are a lot of different types of coverage available. This is probably more applicable to the buyer of the goods that defer to the exporter um, as far as insurance. You know, you're sending it on a CIF term, so the insurance is to be uh, borne by the exporter. Um, I always, uh, I'm, my background is also in, in insurance, um, marine insurance, so cargo being among them. And there are a variety of different terms. Um, some very restrictive that in most cases, your claim will not be paid. It will be uh, denied all the way to all risk, which is what you want on, on the bulk of, uh, of goods. Um, so when somebody else is choosing and paying for it, you, you always want to be a little, uh, a little wary on what the, what the, the cargo insurance actually um, covers. Um, I'm going to have the Paul go over a couple of the foreign borders and how freight forwarder uh, is integrated in there as well. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we're talking about exporting, and most people think of exporting to a, you know, a faraway land. Uh, but really, uh, our our biggest export partners are right here, just north of us and just south of us, Canada and Mexico. Uh, the U.S. does a tremendous amount of business uh, uh, as a country with those two countries. And the process of exporting to those two countries, uh, frankly, couldn't really be much different than it is. They're, they're really polar opposites um, when it comes to the export process. So uh, Mexico first, Mexico is what we uh, call in the freight forwarding business, a closed border transaction. Uh, basically, what that means, we, we say it's a start and stop process. So a U.S. exporter um, puts their shipment together and then gets it to a cross-border point. The most popular and the most common in the United States is Laredo, Texas, but there are four or five other locations in Texas that are you know, pretty active with this sort of cross-border trade uh, as well. And then the shipment stops at the border. Um, and there's a customs process that takes place at the border that gets the shipment pre-certified to enter Mexico. Um, and at some point, it actually crosses the border into a marshalling or holding zone where it's uh, reviewed or examined either directly by Mexican customs or the information is transmitted to Mexican customs electronically. And the cargo is waiting for a release to then carry on uh, into Mexico. Now, that process is highly controlled um, related to Mexico. There are very few U.S. trucking companies that can actually do what I just described, uh, move the cargo from the U.S. all the way through to that holding zone in Mexico and then make the ultimate delivery in Mexico. There are some, but not that many. Uh, it's usually a process where the goods get down to the border and they get what we call transloaded or unloaded and reloaded uh, onto a Mexican truck that can then do that process of moving across the border uh, and making the final delivery. You want to know that because um, in many cases, it means your cargo is going to be handled a little bit more than you might be used to with truck shipments. If we, uh, if we move something from, uh, I don't know, <clears throat> Illinois to Oklahoma, you know, there's some handling of that cargo, but uh, it's pretty clear um, what that routing is going to look like. Um, with Mexico and the unloading and reloading, um, there's a bit more uh, handling and the process is a little bit more unknown to the U.S. exporter typically uh, than with other, you know, export uh, transactions. Um, one tip on the INCO term side, we, we work with a lot of customers and we see terms FOB Laredo, Texas. It's actually a misuse of the term. FOB is, uh, in the 11 INCO terms, FOB is an ocean freight only term. 
It's designed to be used with ocean freight exports going to wherever in the world. And certainly Laredo, Texas is not an ocean port. So the correct term, if you are getting the goods to Laredo and your customer in Mexico is then taking over the processor, the correct term would have to actually be FCA Laredo, Texas, because FCA is a term you can use with all modes of transport, including trucking. Um, so that's just a little nuance, a little distinction. Keep in mind that when you're doing exports to Mexico, even if your responsibility is to get it to the border and your customer in Mexico is taking over the process from there, which is very common, you, the U.S. exporter, still have the export declaration or export compliance responsibilities, full compliance responsibilities that you do with any other export. So just because you're shipping it to, let's say, Laredo, Texas, doesn't mean you're off the hook as far as those export compliance responsibilities and the U.S. government's oversight of your exports uh, to Mexico. So keep that in mind. Your freight forwarder can help you with that to make sure that, that your compliance interests are protected with your Mexico exports, even though your Mexican customer wants to handle that, that cross-border uh, process. If you want to go to the next slide, I think it's Canada. Canada, very different. Uh, Canada is like sending a shipment to uh, Oklahoma, uh, essentially. Um, Canada is what we call a permeable border, uh, not a closed border. And so uh, when the original NAFTA came into place, the reaction from the three com uh, countries was very different. And certainly between Canada and Mexico, the reaction with Canadian exports was to open the border to truck traffic in both directions, uh, truckers, both American truckers and Canadian truckers. And a system was created, essentially a barcoding system was created to allow trucks to move through the border um, in a very quick and easy pace. If you think of um, maybe paying a toll in those states in the United States where you have to pay a toll, um, the, the process of crossing the border between the U.S. and Canada for freight, uh, and certainly pre-COVID, um, is much like paying a toll. Um, there is a process. Uh, it can be pre-certified with barcoding so that truckers can present manifests in advance to customs on either side. Process is very quick. Um, Mexico took a different approach. Uh, they were very protective of their cross-border customs broker and transport companies, and they restricted U.S. involvement uh, really to protect not only those companies, but also the profits that those companies uh, generate at the border. And so two very different um, approaches. Uh, Canada and the U.S. also have a treaty in place, and we have for a long time, to exchange export statistical information on a monthly basis. And so other than with license cargo, there is no export declaration requirement for shipments to Canada from the U.S., uh, and that's a pretty unique distinction, um, and it's, uh, it helps uh, make the process that much easier. Hence, Canada is our number one trading partner of all countries uh, around the world. So exports to Canada are not very difficult. Um, exports to Mexico can be certainly more difficult to close border. The rest of the world operates um, very similarly. Um, so if you think of Canada and Mexico, they have their own nuances. And then if you take Canada and Mexico out of the picture, I would say the vast majority of the rest of the world, the process uh, is pretty similar and pretty regimented for both air freight and ocean freight shipments. There are uh, data elements that have to be submitted to our federal government uh, for both statistical um, compilation as well as compliance purposes. So our government says that exporting is a privilege. It's not a right. So it isn't that every U.S. company has the right to export. Uh, they have the privilege of exporting. And that privilege is something that our government does monitor uh, and wants to make sure that those exports and products moving are also in line with our national interests uh, over a variety of agencies. So uh, the process for the rest of the world, um, there's, a, there's an export sort of declaration process. There's an export customs clearance process in the United States here. And then there's documentation and carriers that move the goods around the world. And that documentation 
kind of unlocks the customs process in the, the destination country so that your customer can ultimately get the goods. Depending on the INCO term you choose, you'll either, you'll either be responsible for the entire process door to door and everything involved in it, or you'll be uh, responsible for maybe just the preparation of the shipment and the loading of the truck that shows up uh, that your customer has hired through their freight forwarder or any, anywhere in between. So the 11 INCO terms really, um, uh, depending on which one you use, um, sort of dictate how much you, the exporter, are going to be responsible for um, in your rest of the world uh, exports. So, and those are, are, as we said before, have some documentation that go with them and certainly carrier relationships. And that's where good freight forwarders that you would develop relationships come into the picture. Uh, I think you're up next, Rich. Yeah, so really, why should we care? As XM Bank, why do we care who you deal with? Why do we care if you work with a freight forward or you don't? Um, I, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about XM. XM Bank exists to grow jobs through export. We do this really by reducing the financial risks associated with exports. And while we don't exist to make a profit the way private uh, companies do, we, uh, we do this to make sure that exporters make a profit and that they continue to succeed and grow. To that end, when an exporter must make a claim because they've not been paid on an export, we want to be able to pay that claim and we want to be able to make them whole. And what we've seen over the years is that inadequate shipping documents are the number one reason for short-term short multi-buyer insurance claims, uh, denials. Freight porters can help with that. They can tighten up the documentation side of things. Failed to ship to the buyer in the buyer's country, among the top three reasons for ESS uh, claim denials, so it's single buyer policies. And that would be proof of export, as in the case of uh, Mexican uh, shipments. So non-compliance with uh, policy shipping requirements hurts the US exporter. Claim denials hurt XM's reputation in the marketplace and people are less likely to come to us to help secure their uh, their exports if we're known as denying claims. We're not, fortunately, because we try to work through these things. We work with exporters to try to get the documentation necessary, but it's always difficult, more difficult, I'll say, to try to reach back and get documentation that should have been had within days of the export. Um, you know, when you're months out, if you, I'm sure if you talk to, to Paul, he says, yeah, trying to find a, a export documentation from five, six months ago is, uh, is, is kind of a burden for his staff. And it takes them away from what they really should be doing, which is processing today's shipment. So it's important that um, the exporter, the broker fully understands the requirements of the XM policy from a shipping documentation standpoint. Uh, requirements differ, as Paul went into, um, depending on where you're exporting uh, to. Um, and we consult, we suggest that you consult with a, a solid freight forwarder um, of, of your choosing. Obviously, Paul is here because, you know, he's well respected in the field. He brings a wealth of knowledge, um, but obviously there are other uh, freight forwarders as, as well. Um, if X works or F terms to the rest of the world, the only acceptable INCO term to foreign buyers, it's very important that you reach out um, ahead of the shipment and make your requirements from a documentation standpoint uh, known. You want to be able to have a complete export file within days of exporting. That will put you in the best position from a regulatory uh, standpoint, as well as from a, a claims uh, standpoint. I'm gonna share my uh, contact slide with you. So maybe you take a picture of it um, and, and we'll move on. Um, I'm gonna share Paul's as well. Take a picture of that. Um, if not, you can reach out to anyone within XM Bank. If you like what Paul said, if you like what I said, if you have additional uh, questions, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. Uh, we're happy to help. If you have immediate questions, we are going to have a Q&A session uh, right now. So Ken's gonna come uh, back on the line 
He's going to gather some uh, questions uh, for Paul and myself, and hopefully we'll answer them to your satisfaction.